Hello and welcome. I'm Sarah Shelton, market editor at Lux Interiors and Design. I'm proud to take part in Lux's celebration of Black History Month, where we're recognizing and showcasing the work of Black artisans and makers that are inspiring us, and that I'm sure will also inspire you. And with that, I would love to introduce the wonderful and kind Carmen Neely, a Chicago-based artist who I had the pleasure of meeting over email a few months ago, and whose talent was the focal point of one of the trend pages in the January-February issue of Lux that's on stands now. Carmen, welcome. I'm so excited we got to do this today. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited too. <laughs> Yeah, no, so happy to have you. So Carmen, when I first saw your art, uh, I was an immediate fan just based on the canvases alone. I mean, look at what's behind you. It's pretty incredible. Um, there's color, there's movement, there's emotion. But, you know, after we kind of had this like pen pal email, you know, back and forth over the past few months, you know, I learned more about how you come to create this art. And I have to say, I find even more beauty and meaning from, you know, knowing such things. Um, and that's what I hope everyone will get today from our chat that, that we're going to have. So before we dive into a canvas, um, I just want to, you know, ask you to give us a little background where you're from, what do you do, what you make, you what you create, um, just like a Carmen 101. Sure. Um, I was born and raised in North Carolina in the South, and I think the really deep connection to uh, familial history through sort of like honoring objects of uh, your personal past, your family's past is really embedded in sort of the nature of my process. Um, I mean, I think that that's a very Southern thing. I know it's not exclusive to Southern culture, um, but for me, I think that's where a lot of that impulse has come from. I was fortunate to know both of my maternal and paternal grandmothers and my great grandmother uh, on my mother's side of the family. And so objects related to their lives have just been very important to me and, and the rest of my family as well in, in sort of like honoring their life and remembering details about them. Um, and when I sort of came to painting practice, I was always drawn to abstraction and not really able to articulate sort of why for a long time I understand the significance of, of gesture um, and its necessity in my practice. But I think just continuing to pursue it and think about how it relates to um, the ways in which I sort of like try to hold memories in my life, it feels so much more, um, it makes so much more sense to me now, sort of like years into it. Um, and I know that like thinking about the specifics of memories and narrative in works like the one behind me that are um, very open-ended can be challenging for people to sort of approach or understand. Um, but I think in the same way that you have an object that is a hat or a piece of furniture or something from a kitchen that's mass produced, right? It is um, something that could exist in many different spaces with many different um, contexts, but because of a history specific to that object um, and what it means to you and who held it and what you know about it, it informs so much more meaning, right? in your relationship to it. And I think for me, that's how I think about movements and paint. I'm creating works that are intentionally trying to channel specifics uh, when it comes to my experience and memories. And I think that hopefully that's something that translates to people when they view the paintings. I mean, it's interesting that you said that sometimes people might have a hard time like relating to abstract art, but I think that's kind of the, maybe the beauty that it's kind of ambiguous depending on, you know, what you're feeling that day. And when you look at it, a piece of art, you know, what you might feel, what might be different from when you look at it another another day. But I, I feel like you said so many great words that I, I think will come up later, you know, um, objects and gesture and emotion and family. So, with that, you know, I just kind of want to dive right into a, a, a canvas and kind of, you know, talk about those gestures. Um, and also, I know you include sometimes ephemera on um, 
on some canvases. And of course, you know, that use of color, which for me, I just keep, keep coming back to the word like movement, like there's just movement in, in, in these works. So do you wanna, you wanna talk about those gestures or walk us through the relationship between, you know, the strokes that we're seeing and the colors, because I mean, it, it looks intentional and, and, and I know you're very intentional with, with, what, with what you do. So we could talk about the piece uh, in particular that's in the magazine in an alternate reality. Um, and that came out of a series I was making dealing with a uh, breakup at the time. And I felt like there was this continued sense of longing and a desire to reimagine um, what could have been that was really present in all of the making of that work. And the title itself in an alternate reality came from a conversation I'd had with the person about literally what could have been different and where we could have ended up if we had done X, Y, and Z or not done, you know, X, Y, and Z. And um, so in that way, making that piece um, was about fantasy. And I think there's a whimsical sort of, uh, energy around that piece that comes from the, uh, the idea of like imagining something that's like not real. Um, and so the palette is really bright. And I, the word that really feels like it resonates to me is like hopeful um, associated with that and that movement. Um, and I was looking for a way to sort of end it and feel uplifted, um, even though simultaneously thinking of something and longing for something that could never be is, is tragic. Like it's also very sort of sad and difficult. Um, and those are things that are so, you know, they're not, they're not so concrete, right? <laughs> but it's what I was trying to communicate through all of those movements and through the layering of all that color. And the object itself actually um, was very specific to that person, it, it, it actually, it's a flower crown that I was wearing sort of the first date, I guess, that we had and ended up being the thing that I was wearing the first, the last, like at the end of the relationship. So this thing was an object that I had in my possession that reminded me of this person every time I saw it in my closet, <laughs> every time I maybe wanted to wear it to like a party or something. And, it, it started to feel like this bookend, right? It was the, a symbol of the beginning and the end of this thing. And I didn't want to, it's really hard for me to just throw things away and discard them, right? Because objects are so important <laughs> to, um, to all these memories. And I think they carry this weight that I want to like respect, right? So putting it in this painting and having it live on through this like, this piece that could sort of show respect and honor for what we shared together felt like the most appropriate way for me to release it and for it to not be sort of, um, yeah, for me to still sort of show care and for it to not be, I guess, discarded, that word again, which feels, um, which feels like disrespectful, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So it's interesting that you know you you were you, you talk about these emotions that may not feel concrete, but yet you made a very concrete, real thing. And and the fact that you know your emotions and in this object you created, you know, it, it memorializes or you know kind of frames that that part of your life. And you know, I'm 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 interested to see like you know people who acquire a work of yours, you know, what kind of meaning that that would take on for for them. Um, so. I think it's 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 interesting that you're making like you're tie, you tie so much emotion to your work, and I think that's what uh, you know. For me, I'm so drawn to it because I know there's this emotional component behind it. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's I know that's a really vulnerable you know thing to share, but it's it's so helpful to learn you know more about you know your process. Um, so aside from the emotionality and the and the feelings and the thoughtfulness that go into these works, I'm curious like when you're in the actual studio which you're in right now and you're painting, like, what does that look like? I'm going to use a cliche, like paint a picture for us, like what it looks like when you're <laughs> in the painting, because the scale is incredible. I mean, it's, 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 wow. So yeah, I'm just curious, like, is there music? Are you, you know, in the zone? Like, what's it like? There's always music. 
always, always. <laughs> it, like, it really um, helps me to stay in an emotion. Um, so it's very specific to the work that I'm making. Um, so like when I was making that piece, for example, in the magazine, that whole series was, it was heavy. It was a lot of sad songs, it was a lot of, it just was, it was a lot of like, I was listening to a lot of Radiohead, um, these really angsty, like slow paced things. Um, and now the work's getting increasingly bigger and bigger. Um, and I have, because also I have the space right now, when I moved to Chicago, I was fortunate to get this amazing studio. So I am, it's very active for me to work on them because I have to like stand on step ladders and move around. Um, but it's, it's like I'm kind of, it's this push and pull between me um, communicating with the piece. I mean, I kind of start off with an idea um, that's a little different every time of like, what I know needs to be present in the work. So maybe I'll start like with this piece, I knew the palette needed to be predominantly these browns and grays. And that was my starting point. And then I just kind of let myself be directed wherever the painting leads me. Um, and then other times it may be that, um, you know, I had another piece with the, talking about the ephemera that you mentioned where I knew there was this disco ball that needed to be like hanging off the side of it. <laughs> and I wasn't really sure what uh -huh. else was gonna happen, but that was my starting point. <laughs> so yeah, it's a it's little different every time depending on what the story is. Of course, yeah, no, that's, I would love to witness, you know, what this, what this process is like. As, as we know, all the things that make you, you influence what you create. Uh, being a woman, a woman of color, a woman from the South. At times, do you feel the weight of one of those factors more than other when, when you're creating? Or is it more like, you know, this artistic fingerprint that is always at play and that you cannot turn off? It's such a, I love talking about this, but it's, also always a really complex and difficult question to answer when you're talking about identity and abstraction and particularly um, being a woman of color and making abstraction because there's a history of really categorizing in a limiting way what that means. And I am constantly sort of in resistance of being boxed into like a particular sort of understanding of the work and my process. Um, but, and simultaneously, like I can never separate my identity from all of my choices. Like none of us can do that. So it is absolutely extremely important, uh, but I have a totally different relationship to the history of abstraction because of this history of othering that also exists in the, in the art world. And uh, because of sort of like the way in which we have been taught to understand abstraction through like a very particular Eurocentric lens. Mm -hmm. And everything that I'm making is in relationship to that um, sort of development within the system that teaches us <laughs> about artworks in that way and about my sort of like lived experience in the world and embodiment of somebody who's like experiencing this kind of othering in every other part of her life as well. Um, but simultaneously, it's so complex because it's like all of that is happening, but also I'm just, I just want to paint and I just want to be intuitively like reacting to color and intuitively reacting to, um, you know, like form and composition. And so it is something that I feel like I can never give, I love this question and I, I want more people to be like diving deep into this conversation. Um, but it's something that like is so big, <laughs> I feel like it's hard to just kind of to summarize and answer, you know, like in a really precise, like succinct <laughs> way. Well, I think you did a, a very eloquent job. It is a hard question. I'm sorry for throwing that one at you, but I just, I felt like it's something <laughs> where, you know, we're like, we're really just scratching the surface. There's a lot to explore there and, and, and we're only going to explore by, by, by diving in. So, uh, appreciate you sharing that. Um. So Carmen, you know, wrapping up, you know, I just want, this is a question I was excited to ask, like what's next? Like, what do you want to manifest? What's the, what, one year down the road, five years down the road, like 
what's what's next? What do you want to do? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I I I want the work. I mean, I totally envision the work getting even bigger and bigger. Like this piece behind me is like, I don't know, it's like 12 feet long. <laughs> I think, I mean, I three times the size. I'm like ready, excited for that, <laughs> for that moment in my career. But also I think expanding um because alongside these paintings which i think are like the heart of my practice and what everything else stems from so there's sculptural objects too that, that come out of this language there are works on paper and like digital collages that i'm working on now that still also expand on this um i am interested in this dialogue between a more sort of like traditional approach and idea of painting with all the evolutions of materiality in our like culture as well. So some of the ephemera that I've been adding are manipulations of gestures from my own work into different material formats. And so sometimes it's like embroidered patches or enamel pens or plaster objects. Um, and I believe like 90 year old version of myself will be like, there will be so many paintings in my studio, but there will also be all of these objects made out of like so many different materials that are an extension of painting, but not painting at the same time. Like I, that's what I envision. I'm totally manifesting that. <laughs> All right, well, you call me when you're 90, I'm coming over. I'm gonna see this amazing studio and this really renowned artist. Um, but Carmen, I, I'm so glad we could chat today and just like let me, let us get a peek into your world and what you're doing. and. Um, you know, we're along for the ride officially, you know, I follow you on Instagram. I think everyone should also, it's a visual feast for the eyes. And also, I just want to also just stress like how, you know, you're all, you're a beautiful visual artist, but also, also you have this wonderful way of words as a, as an editor, I found myself reading your artist statement over and over. It's quite lovely. And even just in the emails we had, you know, it, I feel like you just were, you know, so rich with words. So with that, everyone go find Carmen on Instagram and hopefully we can see your paintings in real life when we can have shows and exhibits again. But Carmen, I look forward to being in touch and, and thank you so much for, for hanging out with us today. Thank you. Hey, design friends, this is Cindy Allen, and welcome to another episode of At Home, where we take you inside a designer's own cherished home. Today, we head out to Eastern Long Island to the South Fork, where one of the industry's top American architects celebrating classic modernism today, Lee Mandel, our very own Lee of Shelton Mandel, designs his own stunning waterside retreat. And trust me, this is something special. Hi, Lee. Hello. Hello, Cindy. <laughs> How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Nice to see you. Always so, ni so nice, nice to see you, too. Yeah. You know, I remember, it was a long time ago now, but I remember when you started building this home. Um, tell us a little bit about, because I remember the little house before this house. Well, there was a little Unabomber shack on here. A very humble Unabomber shack on a absolutely magnificent site. And I thought of, gosh, if one could take advantage of the context and explore the different vocabularies on Long Island, what a wonderful opportunity it was. So I remember standing on the crumbling Unabomber shack's roof with a ladder. Oh, really? Kind of fantasizing about the views. And it was kind of a scrubby site, but there was water and there was the sunset. And what brought the painters to the Hamptons was the water and the sunset. So I thought, if, if maybe this could be something, um, we could build a job without an apparent client. Right. So I didn't yeah. want to think of myself as a client. I wanted to think of the idea as the client and follow the idea through. Lee, how hard was that to do, actually? It was really rough because yeah. um, Neighbors are always afraid of people that come in, particularly of architects, into older neighborhoods. And when they see something like 
a concrete truck coming in, they think you're building a nursing home. Right, right. The construction and scaffolding, they're always afraid that you're going to undermine their neighborhood and their context. Our goal was to do the opposite. Right, of course. The irony, and I worked on this with my best friend from Harvard GSD, Reed Morrison. We worked on this, it was such a challenge on the site, with the setbacks and the new zoning codes to build something that actually ultimately kind of disappeared, even though it was different than what was here. And the irony is now when you walk across uh, the, the beach or whatever, and you look towards this site, you kind of can't tell what's going on here. And all the old contextual houses look much louder and more prominent than this was. So I was the turtle killer, the person killing the neighborhood and took an awful lot of grief from everybody. But now people are quite happy because how you have the opportunity in architecture to respect the environment and not build a mausoleum per se and explore things and views. And in fact, the site is nicer because of the intervention here than if you created something that looked just like the, the neighbor's buildings. Right, so you, had, so you had water to the north and yet you wanted to bring the light in from the south. So, yes. so let us know how you well, actually came up with the design. Very, very good question, Cindy, because <laughs> that's, the, that's the conundrum when you have views that face north, right. you wanna get the south light, how do you deal with that? So uh, we created this kind of origami structure um, that complied with the street geometry on the front and it is a, a concrete structure which is clad in a kind of quilt of contextual yeah. wood that relates to all the architecture around it. There are gestures that look like a drawbridge, a refreshment stand peeled off of the facade, a barn door that peels off of the facade. So it was to draw on not only with architectural components, but with the landscape components of the project did the same thing. Create a quilt of the contextualism to celebrate the, the area we were in. So we took- I like it, how you describe it. I won't say it, you just describe how you opened it, how you- Well, it's, it's kind of like an origami puzzle that opens up and closes, you know, and the building itself breaks open to answer your question of how do you deal with north view and south light. The building is organized on a boardwalk and everything on the light south side of the boardwalk complies with the street geometry. But then in order to bring the light and to break towards the geometry on the north exposure, the building shifts and breaks open. So everything along the boardwalk on the water side is affected by the current of the water and it is pulled away from its other volume creating a kind of crevice and a shift. And in that shift from up above, the south light comes in and informs the house. So you, you, the attempt was to try to get the best of all the worlds that were here. The beautiful south light in the front, which is more private because it is the front. And then the shifting geometry along the water and the water views. So the shift in those geometries create beautiful diagonal axes through the house. So you can always see front and back but it's very private and it looks very small from the front. And as you move towards the side, the hypotenuse of the triangle is always the largest dimension. Those components that you see the shift are on an angle. So they look larger, but they're very discreet because you never see them from the street or the water, only along the boardwalk. So- I like how you describe, wait, I like how you describe that the opening, which you're describing as origami, but you described it as opening it like a cracked egg. It is. It's. Yeah. Um, it is, and then you, it's almost as if you took the shells of the egg and you shifted them, and you got the experience of, of the void between the two. Right. And um, so this sort of, what separates the two buildings is a glass wedge, actually. The building has a wedgie. So. <laughs> the building's got a wedgie? There you go. There's some of that, of that Lee humor. Yes, so it's got the <laughs> glass wedge, and... Um, it sparkles all the time and it feels like a lighthouse in a way. It respects the water and the discrete shell of the building is made up of the contextual components of all the neighboring houses and uh, adjoining properties. You know, it's funny because the, the front of the house 
also feels very hidden. I thought when I was looking at pictures that that may have been the back of the house at first, like where you got married, right? The, the glass, the more glassy side is to the view. Mm -hmm. But the way the light was achieved in the front was the wedge pops up above everything. So that totally fills in the house with light, but it allows the front to be private and discreet. Mm -hmm. So from the street, it's very low key. Yeah. And yeah, I loved, I loved, I actually loved that, Lee, when I figured out, oh, it's sort of, it's hidden, but it's in the front of the house. I thought that was really special. Well, the, um, another, another issue in these site plans that you have to deal with are enclosures of spaces, outdoor spaces, for example, swimming pools in certain areas, you have to have fences, but fences sometimes look like they're enclosing something. So we created a series of gates areas right so no enclosure is the same that surrounds an area so by creating the stone retaining walls they look like an entry to something and then the other closure is done through other means so around the pool there are actually four types of enclosure that give it the legal enclosure one is the stone retaining wall the other is a kind of hidden fence in the planting the other is a kind of barn uh, meadow indigenous fence, and then the building itself. So you're never aware that you're being enclosed. Was the pool house built at the same time, Lee? Yes. It was. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it feels, it, you know, it feels like it was always meant to be there, and yet it has its own personality at the same time, which I love. Well, that, that's an interesting point, because the, since that's closest to the property line, the intention there was to make a transition from the small contextual architecture. So there's a gable that's fully exposed in the first bay that's quite low. In the second bay is a semi-enclosed gable, same, same gable. And in the third is a fully enclosed. Mm. So that is the transition on that corner where that indigenous building, as it were, has a glass curtain wall that you never see until you're in the back and that foreshadows all the glass used in the main building. So let's talk, so let's get, we'll, we'll talk about the pool house because it's fantastic, but let's get inside the house. Okay. How many, how many, how big is it? How many bedroom and baths are there? Um, I, I've never counted the square footage here. <laughs> um, An architect who doesn't know the square footage. I, I love well, it. I purposely don't because no, I, no. But it's it's three bedrooms in the main house, mm. and in the pool house, there's a, a bedroom upstairs. Mm. Each of them embraces views of the landscape and gets a little surprise when you're in each of those spaces. Everything is glorious, let's face it. Um, I, I, I can see that there's, you know, you're sweeping up. Is mm. that in the living room? There's a two-story corner. I mm -hmm. call it multi-useless sleeping uh, sitting areas because there's so many that places to look at the view. So they're multi-useless, which are the best kind. <laughs> wedge is two-story, and then the sort of dining, sitting area has a two-story corner. And I'm in the living room now, which is a more of a one-story thing. So mm. these, these spaces are sculpted and hollowed out in different places. And you also have to, you're, you're connecting two sides of the house on the second story, right? Yeah, there is a, a, a bridge that connects the master suite from the other bedrooms. And it, it's a sculptural component because instead of having railings, it, it's a kind of glass tunnel that, that is in the wedge, completely illuminated. And uh, it's even, you can see through the bottom, it's made of subway grating. So it, it feels transparent. You know, you sort of found a way, I don't know how you do it, Lee, but you know, every interior almost looks like an art gallery, but it feels warm and inviting at the same time. We were very conscious here of the need to have a pH balance of warm and cool. Uh -huh. The concrete on its own is very gray. Right. It can be very cool. And wood on its own can be too hot and warm. So here we used um, farm eucalyptus, um, large architectural expressions of it, the core of the building and a whole side of um, uh, kitchen and, and, and HVAC area. And so 
there was an attempt to balance warm and cool. The wood components are large architectural elements, and when they're juxtaposed against the concrete, they create a balance. They don't own a gender, they don't own a hot or a cold, they neutralize each other, and they are better off because of their adjacency. The wood is so happy to be by the concrete, you know, to cool off, and the concrete is so happy to be by the wood to warm up. And all the glass, too. And the glass. So, yeah. and plus, we made an attempt to make a very honest building where you can understand exactly how it's constructed. The challenges of that, for example, was in revealing all the slabs, the electrical work had to be set with beer cans in the pouring of the slabs because you have no drop ceiling or anything. And we hit it right 99% of the time. There are uh -huh. a couple of holes in there that had to get filled that didn't quite make it. But generally, it was hard, but it was worth it because you understand the full shell, the full, uh, the full enclosure, and the logic of a building. To mm. cover up the logic of a building sometimes is a crime. Buildings often look better when they're framed and when they're completed. So the attempt here was to explore that idea of how to look at the shell of something while also creating finishes and an hierarchy within it. You have like, you know, obviously you have such amazing collection of furniture and objects from the 20th century and so many artists are represented there. That's your calling card in a way. You know, we always expect to be surprised with you, Lee. When we started the practice, I was so grateful to be trained by great people who actually I was trained by or people that I studied. And at the time, it seemed possible to actually be able to acquire those things very reasonably. And I was determined in this project to explore my own architectural mm -hmm. DNA and the people that all meant something to me, I felt I wanted them to be able to have a conversation together and that I could still be their pupil in that conversation. So they're all represented here in different pieces. Uh, Le Corbusier is speaking to Charlotte Perrion, who's speaking to Arne Jacobson, who's speaking to Gio Ponti. They're all happy. They're all happy friends playing with, playing with Lee, right? And well, having a conversation with themselves, and I'm their pupil and student, so I'm still in awe of who they are, and I'm almost intimidated that these represent those people who mean so much to me and taught me so much. You also like have an amazing hand with color, which is very hard to do. And you're just so, you're so brilliant I at that. I never think of pop of color. It's one of my pet peeve sayings. I just, really? I, I, I call them tableau jobs, okay? Okay. Because, because there are kind of relationships that objects form with each other in the dialogue. And if you listen to the object and you look at the context, um, something comes out of that conversation. Um, for example, in this site, the grasses are all chartreuse and the leaves can turn orange and there are woods everywhere. Now, if I duck to the side, you'll see that in this room, that is expressed in the woodland <laughs> ceramics. They're on the back console there. I now, see them. I see them. <laughs> so the grasses over here, they look like the grass is coming up. So when you're inside and you're looking at these pops of color, they're not really pops of color. They're the nature that's happening in the site. So you're starting to relate them to the context that's here and they don't seem alien. They seem like they're having a relationship not only with themselves, but with what's going on outside. And so that way, nothing really seems alien here in, as, as, as an attempt to do so. I mean, I've probably failed many times, but you kind of look outside and you look inside yourself and then things start to happen by feeling deeply about what you're doing. And, and that's a hard thing to express to anybody, yeah. the feelings we have inside and reaching inside yourself to try to find an answer. And I see that you, like you have a yellow wall in a room that just works 
it's like you said, it's almost like a language. And I'm going to tell you why that yellow wall is in there. Okay, tell me. I want to know. It's the only room deprived of the sunset. Oh. And there's a, a Calder um, tapestry, straw tapestry, that is the sun, that hangs on the wall of the only room deprived of the sunset. So that's why that's there. The other guest room, which is not deprived of the sunset, has a blue wall. Mm. But those are also the colors of the Bauhaus, of Charlotte Perrion, of Le Corbusier, and all the people that taught me so much. And then there's a dematerialization in the house of the color of wood, of driftwood, of sky, of water, of clay, of sand. And those components make up the vocabulary here. I love that. I love that. And it, and it makes perfect, and it makes perfect sense. And I, you can see how much care and consideration for every single thing, like that's who you are, Lee. And that's why you're so special. All right, but let's move to the pool house where, which is very exuberant and fun, still edited and restrained. And there is a different kind of color, um, what, what were you trying to say there? Actually, same color, but in a different way. Well, I, I was again being trained sort of the Bauhaus and through Mondrian and Albert's disciples. I was also thinking of the when this, a swimming pool was built and we were able to acquire the Tony Rosenthal cube, that pool toys are always bright colors. Yeah. So in tandem with the Bauhaus, in tandem with pool toys, the pool house becomes a pool toy. And all the shapes and things in there are dolphin shape, they're amorphic, they're of the water. And that again, that relationship of the things outside the blue water and the sculpture and the things inside relate to each other. But they're appropriate there because that's not the bay side. That, that, that is, it's the pool side, which has an oblique view of the bay, but it's very different. I wouldn't want to distract from Peconic Bay but at the pool, which is a little more discreet, you could then create relationships of inside and out that, that belong to that part of the project. Hmm. And yet when you go up to the bedroom, it's very quiet, it's very serene. Well, the intention there was, was like you were climbing the maple tree outside. I love There's that. Maple in there, the ceiling, the walls, um, the floor, and you feel like you're in a tree house up there, up in the eaves, and uh, with an overlook, and all you see are trees and water when you look out of there, so it feels very cozy up there, very quiet. And that, and that house, and the pool house, is cl as closer to the street, right? And the vernacular yes. is, yes, is more, um, I don't want to say, more farm, <laughs> more modern uh, farm. It, I don't, it, how would you describe that? Farm. It leans into cottage. It has latent cottage tendencies. Right, right, exactly. But then it transitions later as we move down the site by the water into the two-story glass, which foreshadows the glass in the wedge along the boardwalk. Perfect, perfectly said. Now I'm afraid to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love, I love the aerial shot of the the whole the whole setup. Um, the, the angles are so delicate and so beautiful. And then the water beyond, it's really something, a, a, well, I, I mean, don't you want to show everybody from above? <laughs> well, I have to say, I got a drone for my birthday. That was the maiden voyage. And then I crashed it five minutes later. That drone's not working so well, but we got that footage out of it. We had to have a tree climber come up and get that thing to get the film out of it. But it is beautiful from above. I was very happy to see from the air, it looked like the diagram we drew initially. That was perhaps one of the most gratifying things that you start with a bubble diagram. Right. And then 10 years later, you end with a bubble diagram. That was, that was rewarding. When we worked with the RF landscape, one could say, how could you compete with a water view? You know, a water view is special, but right. There's so many views out here that are beautiful. And what are those? If you were to kind of make a quilt of the architecture as we, of the landscape as we did with the architecture, one could say, well, they're the beautiful horse fields here. There are beautiful meadows. There are wonderful hedges. There's wonderful lawn. There's water and there are grasses. 
So what were the appropriate places to incorporate that thing? So the building is surrounded by the collage of the landscapes, just as the building itself is a collage of the context. So to the water side, um, you know, a lot of people think they have to rip up everything to get a water view. That's what's destroyed our shoreline. So we actually, in working with the DEC, planted all these grasses and all the indigenous things. So in the rear of the house, it almost looks like the tide of the water comes right up to the back terrace, as it were. Okay. So those grasses are four and five feet high. There are three types. There's fescue. And so whatever season it is, they turn a color. Now they're chartreuse, they will go purple, then they will go beige. They're just beautiful no matter what season. And when the wind blows and the rain is on them, it's mesmerizing to hear that and watch that beautiful, beautiful movement. Definitely. And so Lee, tell us what, what this compound, uh, what does it mean to you? When you, you were telling me that you create spaces that, um, that calm people, you're a very energetic guy. What's it like when you get out there? Well, I'm really um, an employee of the place because to, to keep it right, you know, you, you want to make sure it's always okay. But I have to say, particularly during COVID, which has been challenging for all of us, I am so grateful and so appreciative of this, which I had taken for granted and was working so in so many far off places that I could never get here to the point that I am now. So to be able to see the seasons change, we felt like an infiltration of the movie, The Birds with Tippi Hedren. All right. On the dock that goes out, we had bulls and all kinds of ospreys and ducks and stuff. And they used the dock as a forensic kind of mortuary table. So they come in the morning and they bring all their roadkill there. <laughs> you talk about blue jays and all this stuff because uh, people backing off of the environment has also opened it up and, and clams and crabs. So I have a, a great appreciation. I'm, I'm looking out the window now and I'm watching the maple tree in the back, the shadow against the solar veil. And I'm thinking, that's amazing. And, and yesterday I was just looking up and watching the movement of nature and it's made me more conscious of that. And I'm so grateful for that because we can take it for granted. Is there a, a favorite room or a favorite spot in the house that you always gravitate towards? I discover a new favorite place almost every day. Like right mm -hmm. now, I never sit in here, but I want it to be proper for you. <laughs> so now this fantastic. is the place because it's my favorite place with you. Right. So it depends who you're with to have your favorite place. It's never on my own. It's sharing it with somebody and finding something about it. And when people come to visit, letting them find a place that they like, and then I rediscover it through their eyes. And that, that's a lot of fun. I bet everyone wants to stay in the, at the pool house in the guest tree house room, right? We'll have people take the master bedroom too. People have taken everything. Oh my God, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Lee? Well, you if they want to take the master, then my new favorite place is the pool house. Right. Of course, to go there and you have a new experience. I've slept in every room, not with every person, but I've slept <laughs> in every room. I don't want to know about this. I don't want to know about this. But I've enjoyed the experience of everyone. I mean, one of the bedrooms is all the Corbusier's dorm perch, and the room is kind of divided in two places. So. I love that. It has the blackboards from his the school he designed. And another room has Perry and things in it. And the master bedroom has a suite of the Clint furniture from Scandinavia. Love that. Love he, that. Most master bedrooms don't have a piano, but there's a little another library space adjunct to it. So there's a piano that I bang on occasion. So each of these at different times of the year when it snows, some places look better. The fireplace looks better when it's snowing. No, but uh, and the most beautiful and the most beautiful experience, um, can I say, is that that you got married? You just recently got married there. Yes, in the middle of a biblical rainstorm, when the skies cleared for the ceremony, and then it started to rain right after, 
and then the most beautiful sunset ever. It was a really wonderful experience. And we had a very limited few of pe group of people and we did the six foot on center spacing of her toy chairs, which was very nice. Well, that's so beautiful, Lee. Thank you for sharing that. Um, blessings to you and Jose and all the love in the world. And this is a house that is your house, your forever house, right? I hope so. Yeah. I, I used to feel too much like an employee, and now I feel like I'm a resident. Yeah. <laughs> because COVID has made, allowed me to make the transition. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It's magical. Um, for all these years um, to have this time together to talk about it. Next time we're going to tour, it's going to be together, but this is as best as we can do for now. I also want to thank you for the support you've given this house. It, has, mm -hmm. it meant so much to me. I can't tell you the acknowledgement and, and the um, interest in it. Are you and, kidding? I want to share it with everybody. <laughs> so and watch out, you're, you're going to have a lot of people going, oh, I was just in the neighborhood. <laughs> Well, when COVID is over, let's talk about that. Absolutely. Okay. okay. All, All right. right. Well, big hug, love and blessings. Take Thank care. So Bye, everybody. Good to see you. See you at the next at home. That's right. <laughs>